Good morning, everyone. And, and thank you, Dave, for that music. Your, your voice is fine, um, so you're, you're good to go. <laughs> so, um, we are going to um, open the book of 1 Corinthians today. And 1 Corinthians is an interesting book, and we've discussed it before. About 25 years ago, I was at a, a Brian Bible Fellowship Conference, and Ricky Kurth was the pastor, and we were going through 1 Corinthians. So I, I was a little younger, and I remember him saying something that just blew me away, and it was the start of actually making me study a few things. He said, if, if you'll never understand the book of 1 Corinthians, or even 2 Corinthians, unless you understand that there's two churches within this church. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and he went on to explain that there was a kingdom church and a grace church that were together. And it, it helped me to understand because once that made sense, the whole book of 1 Corinthians finally made sense because 1 Corinthians is a hodgepodge of, of everything. We've got guys speaking in tongues. We've got miracles. You know, we, we've got um, feasts being observed. We just have a, a total mess where people just aren't getting along. And the reason is because these two churches are together, and we're going to show you today why that is. And that's why we went back and looked at, at Acts 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13, because that's the answer, too. And once you put all this together, I think it makes Scripture just open up, and it's amazing. Because the issue comes down to things that I, I know we maybe sometimes don't care about was, but at, in the book of Acts, what happened after Acts 13? In other words, were people still added to the kingdom program, or did all those people become members of the body of Christ? And these are debates that have been going on since forever. But until you can get a handle on that, and again, the answer is that no, the kingdom saints stayed kingdom saints, okay? And they stayed kingdom saints until they died. But nobody was added to the kingdom program after Acts 28. But between uh, basically, you know, beginning of Acts and Acts 28, or, and if you want to start the church, the body of Christ in 9 or 13, doesn't matter. But during that time in the middle, we had two churches going on side by side with two different programs, which worked, but didn't work, okay? And, and it was that transition. Now, the exciting thing is when grace ends, there's not going to be a transition back. What God's going to do at the end of grace is pull all the grace believers out and rapture them to heaven. And so we won't have this mess going on when God goes back to the kingdom program. But if you can see two churches in, in Corinthians, the whole book will open up and make a lot of sense. But Paul goes to Corinth in Acts 18. And this is on his second missionary journey. It says, After these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth, and found a certain Jew, Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus lately because from Italy, with his wife Priscilla. And don't ever name your kids, you know, Priscilla or Aquila, okay? Um, anyways, uh, Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. So we obviously know from the context of that that we have two, two Jewish believers that are not part of the body of Christ. They're, they're Jewish. They're part of the kingdom program. They're believers, and Paul runs into them, so, which is fine. There's no problem with that at all, but don't think there were any grace believers there. And verse 3 says, And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them. This is, this is Paul. Paul, remember, was a, a tent maker. That was his second job. And wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he, this is Paul, he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath. Now again, does anybody know when God changed the Sabbath to Sunday? That's a trick question. He never did, okay? <laughs> he, he never did, okay? It's not there, all right? And a lot of Christians are like, oh, no, the new Sabbath now is Sunday. No, it's not. The Sabbath is still Friday night to Saturday night. God never changed the Sabbath. And so when Paul is going into the synagogue on the Sabbath, he is talking to Jews. And what is he going to tell them, okay? He's, he's going to tell them, basically, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be. And that, that's the important things, because that's the number one thing the Jews didn't believe. They didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. They didn't believe he was the Christ. That's why he was killed. He was an imposter. He was a fake. And that's where they needed to catch up at. So if you're going to go into the synagogue and talk to Jews, that's where you have to start. Okay? Uh, and that's really important you understand that. Okay? Now, Paul first visited Corinth about 50 A.D. during the last phase of his second missionary journey. He came to Corinth after visiting Athens and staying with a couple Jewish tent makers, Aquila and Priscilla, 
who had recently been forced to leave Rome due to an edict by the Emperor Claudius. Paul was joined in Corinth by Silas and Timothy under their ministry. The church grew. Okay, The first letter of Paul to the Corinthians probably was written around 53 to 54 from Ephesus. And Paul deals with problems that arose in the early years after his initial missionary visit. So, Paul was there in 50 to 51 and 53 and 54. He's writing them after he's gone and fixing things that happen after he left. And a lot of these things are just because of, there was a lack of technology, there was a lack of travel. Um, and because of that, things just took time. I mean, we are so spoiled today in regards to to text messaging and, and emails and phone calls that we don't realize how slow things happened years ago. You know, in order for Paul to get somewhere, he didn't jump into a car or jump in an airplane. He had to physically walk or, or ride an animal. And uh, to get messages back and forth, he had to have a courier or send a message by a courier. Uh, th things were very different. So that's why things just took took time. Okay, back to Acts 18. Verse 5, And when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Now again, th th this is important. And people are like, well yeah, he told them Christ died on the cross for their sins and he was buried and rose again because that was the only message that was available in Acts 18. No, no it wasn't. We still had both churches going on and, and I, I call this the law of first exposure which basically means the Jews. <laughs> The Jews still had another chance. In fact, God kind of gave them three strikes. And finally in Acts 28, God said, you know, strike three, you're out. And that's when there were no two options. So you have to understand that or this isn't going to make any sense. So he's telling the Jews that they're not saved, basically, even though they're, quote unquote, religious. They're going to the synagogue. Going to church or going to the synagogue doesn't save you like it didn't save them, okay? Now, so Paul, Paul goes in there and he's explaining to him who Jesus was, all right? And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood is upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go to the Gentiles. Now, th this is a dispensational thing. And again, that's what the book of Acts is about. Israel being set aside. So what Paul's basically saying is, you guys had your chance. You've rejected the Messiah. Now I'm going to go to the Gentiles with the grace message. So Paul is, in a sense, teaching both messages too. Okay, He's got a kind of a different message to the Jews versus the Gentiles. And he departed thence and entered unto a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. Now, Again, unless you understand what that means, it's not going to make a whole lot of sense. When your house is joined hard, it means you had a common wall. In other words, he went out of the synagogue, went to the next door over, and went into that guy's house because they were joined together on a common wall. If any of you live in an apartment building and your neighbors are right next door, what's the problem? You hear them all the time, right? <laughs> Although nowadays they do a little better job of, of soundproofing things and, like, and things like that. But w Paul went next door, you know. Now, Okay, well, what did Paul do? He basically said, all right, you guys aren't going to let me in the synagogue. I'm going to go next door and start another church. We're, I don't know if this was a church split, but I would say it probably was, okay? We'll call it a synagogue split. How does that sound, okay? And Crispus, okay? Now, remember this name. It's going to come back to, to in our discussion as time goes on. The chief ruler of the synagogue believed on the Lord. Now, again, what, what does that mean? I, I, I don't know. To me, it sounds king to me, okay? Uh, with all his house and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Now, water or spiritual? What do you think? I think it's water. Totally water. These were Jews that were water baptized, which puts them, I mean, puts them in the kingdom program. But where are they now? They're next door in Paul's new Grace Church. Now, did they become Grace believers? No. Were they taught Grace? Oh, yeah. Uh, in fact, most of the people that Paul hung around with uh, understood grace, but they still had a kingdom hope. And again, once you see that, it's like, oh, now it makes sense. We've got a church full of kingdom saints and a church full of grace believers, and the kingdom saints were still following all the food laws, and they were still following all the feast days, and they were doing all these things, and they had these spiritual gifts, they had these sign gifts, and they were flaunting them in front of the grace believers, and it was a mess. And then that's really what was going on. Then spake the Lord to Paul at night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak and hold thy peace. Now why do you think 
God had to encourage Paul? What was Paul's concern, do you think, when he laid at night in bed? What did the Jews that didn't like him always want to do to him? Remember? <laughs> yeah, bump him off. Yeah. You think you got it bad? Paul had a, a price on his head constantly. And uh, there are a lot of people that were really serious about wanting to see him dead. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. God is promising Paul divine protection and intervention. That, that's, that's there. Um, please do not go to that verse and say you're getting the same thing. This was during that transitional period, and Paul was given that, that sign. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God according to them, among them. And when Gallio was the deputy of Achia, the, the Jews made in, in, insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. All right, so now we got problems, all right? Saying, this fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Galileo, Galileo said unto the Jews, If it be were a matter of wrong or wicked lawless, or lewdness, of ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. Now what he's basically saying is, guys, you're bringing this man before me with a civil matter, but it's actually a church matter. It's a doctrine matter. Now, does a non-Christian care about church inner problems? <laughs> Probably not. Okay? But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look he for it, for I will be no judge of such matters. But he's saying is take your dirty laundry and do something else with it because this is not a civil matter. This is an internal matter. I don't care. Okay? So the Romans did not want to get involved in what's going on. And he drew them from the judgment seat or threw them out. Okay? Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, whoever that guy's name is, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Galileo cared for none of these things. So basically, these guys got mad at the guy who was now running the synagogue, and they beat him up. Because maybe they didn't like the way he presented it. I don't know. But we, we got an issue going on here, okay? Um, and Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence to Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shrown his head, that word, shaved it, his head, <laughs> for he had a vow. That's where you shave your head, right? Now, why did Paul cut all his hair off? And why did he take a vow? When's the last time you did that, Scott? You got a nice head of hair. Never, right? Why did Paul do that? He didn't want to offend. There you go. Now, and this is something I think people need to understand. Just because Paul is part of the body of Christ and he's free from all these rituals and all of these, these, these rules and regulations doesn't mean he can't voluntarily put himself back under them just to show the fact that he supported the Jewish religion in the sense he knew it was still going on. Now, having said that, as a grace believer, our job is not to continually try to offend people. So we sometimes impose rules on ourselves just to make sure that we don't offend people. Um, let me see once. Growing up, uh, I was told that you can't go to bowling alleys. You guys know why you can't go to bowling alleys? What? Well, people smoke like crazy. You couldn't even see the pins years ago. Remember that? <laughs> and so you don't want to hang around those smoking people, right? And I also was told I couldn't go play pool because what kind of people play pool? Drinkers and smokers, all the disgusting people. And you can't go to a grocery store that sells alcohol because then I guess you're an alcoholic. And they had all these rules and you can't go to a movie theater because they show bad movies and good movies. And we had all these rules. Now, if they had a, a rule today that said that you can't um, go to a grocery store that sells alcohol, how many of you uh, aren't going shopping ever again? I mean, you, you can't do that anymore. You know? but, but a lot of times you, you do things just because you don't want to offend anyone. But Paul did this to show the Jews that, he, and that's how he got in trouble. He went back to Jerusalem, too. He went with a bunch of guys and took a vow and shaved his head, and they got all mad at him. But you can put yourself, if you want to come to me and say, Dave, I think the food laws make sense. And I'll go, you know what? They probably do. You know, anybody who likes to eat bottom-feeding fish and, and pork and stuff, maybe they shouldn't, you know, maybe there's some good to that. And I have no problem with that. 
but don't tell me, and all grace believers have to do it too. Okay? There's a difference. You can make any rule you want, but when you start imposing it on everyone else, that's when it's a problem. But under Jewish law, you didn't have a choice. You did it, or you weren't part of the program. The works showed your faith, and God had all kinds of works for him to do. So Paul is he's putting himself back under this works program just, I basically think, to show the Jews that God's still working with them. Now, they're being set aside. I understand that. But the, the kingdom program was not discontinued in Acts 13 or Acts 9 where God said, alright, no more works. No, they continued to do their works and obey the law. And Paul voluntarily supported that because he was a Jew too. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 1. That's the background now, okay? Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and uh, that guy we ran into him earlier remember we ran into him Just call him our, brother. our brother he was that guy that used to run the synagogue so he would be what Jewish okay so so Paul is, is this guy either hung around Paul or, or he's friends with Paul and they're writing this letter basically under the church of God which is at Corinth to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints now sometimes the King James reads a little funny um, what it really says is called saints you know that and saints means set apart you know at the moment of salvation you're a saint it's not a process where you got to be dead for 500 years so everybody forgets who you are, and then they decide you were good, you know. <laughs> and that's the rules, you know. I mean, it, it's, that's how it goes. We are a saint at the moment of salvation. We're set apart, okay. Now, people get offended if you say, oh, just call me Saint Dave. You know, they, they don't, you know. You know, <clears throat> yeah, right, okay. <laughs> there you go, yeah, that's true. But well, you usually didn't hear that. Nick, Nick said they call him Saint Nick. Yeah, okay, all right. Do you bring presents on Christmas too and stuff? <laughs> so we're, we're saints. We're set apart. So understand in Christ you are set apart. Understand you are justified. Understand you are sanctified. I mean, it doesn't get any better at the moment of salvation. And that Paul is basically telling them that they're, they're saved, okay? With all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ. And then he says something interesting. Remember I said earlier, two churches? Both theirs and ours. He's obviously talking to two groups of people. One of them is them and one of them is us. Okay, And, and there's other places in Corinthians where we're going to see it a little more obvious. But he's including both groups. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4, he says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Now, for those of you who have ever read ahead, does the Corinthian church have problems? Many. Oh, many. They, they say it's the, the most unorganized group that Paul worked with, the most problems. It, it was the typical church in America, they say. I mean, it, it, they didn't get along. Yet, this sounds pretty encouraging, doesn't it? <laughs> like he's pretty proud of them. And now again, Paul only writes Christians. Christians under grace cannot lose their salvation. But they can sure walk away from the truth and they can sure struggle with getting along. Okay, So understand that. Just because you're saved doesn't mean all your ducks are in order. Okay, That's something you have to want to do. It's called growing in grace and growing in Christ. All new Christians start out as babes in Christ, and all new Christians are carnal. But they're saved. But then there's a process of growing in Christ. And carnal means fleshly, okay, is what it means. And so Paul's proud of them. Well, he's proud of them because they're saved, and that's good. So that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you are called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, if you read these verses, you can understand this fits in both groups. Because what were the kingdom of saints waiting for? They are waiting for Christ to come back to set his kingdom up, right? What are we waiting for as grace believers? For Christ to come back and get raptured out. So and I, I can say, hey, this, this works for both. Because in a sense, both groups are waiting for Christ for a little different reason. Now the kingdom of saints have to go through the, the tribulation. Um, 
we are gone. You know, if the if the rapture would have occurred during Paul's lifetime, um, we know for sure uh, Aquila and Priscilla would not have been raptured. You're like, why not? Well, they're part of the kingdom program. They have to go through the tribulation. Only grace believers are raptured out. Now, obviously, all those people now are, you know, are, are dead and, and gone. But and all that's left is just body of Christ believers. But if they would have occurred during Paul's lifetime, you would have had certain of Paul's friends that still stayed behind. It would have been very interesting. I think more than anything else. Now, verse ten, Paul. You know, he starts out saying how amazing they are and how happy he is, and now he's going to tell them that they've got to work on a few things. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, and that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now that's probably something that every church in America and in the world should read every Sunday morning, right? What, what is that basically saying? You just got to get along, okay? Now, now I understand part of life is not getting along. And, and we don't have to always agree on everything, but the question is, what do you do when you don't agree? Okay, that, that's the issue. If you don't agree with somebody, what do you do to them? Punch them, hit them, kill them, yell at them, you know, slap them in the, the, the back of the big Bible. Did that work? It did? Okay, all right. So that, that, that's the answer. Slap them on the back of the big Bible. I would not recommend that, but in, if you're dealing with Nick, do it. I guess it works, okay? <laughs> All right, so it has been declared unto me, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, in other words, a snitch, <laughs> poor guy, I, I, I feel sorry for Miss the Chloe household, that there are contentions among you. In other words, uh, guys, the word has got back to me that we're not playing nice, is what it's basically saying. Now, this I say that every one of you saith. Now, the, the thing we got to realize here is, what was the problem? Now, I want you to get back to the thought I was telling you. There were some people in the church that were kingdom and some people in the church that are body of Christ. So if you're a kingdom saint, who, who is your leader in the sense? Peter. Peter, James, John, the twelve, okay, Christ is the Messiah. Is Paul your leader? Mm, not really. Okay, if you're a grace believer, who are you looking to? Paul. What do you think of the twelve? Well, they're nothing. <laughs> okay. Yesterday's mail. They're cool. Yesterday's mail. Different program. And I think that's what the issue was. Because some are saying, I am a Paul, or Paul's the best, all right? And others are saying, I'm Apollos. Now, again, Apollos was a kingdom saint. He was a really good talker, really eloquent in speech, but he came out of the kingdom church. Cephas, that's another name for what? Peter, and of Christ. Now, I think the issue was they were arguing about who the leader was of their, their program, whether it be grace or kingdom. But either way, they were what? They were worshiping men. Is it ever a good idea to, to follow one particular person? If you follow somebody's particular person, will they ever disappoint you? Yes. yes. How, how many times? Yeah, always. You guys are so negative. <laughs> but that's the truth, okay? All of us are flawed. You know, I mean, hopefully we have most of our ducks in order, but once in a while, all of a sudden, one will wander off, okay? And you got to be aware of that. That's just human nature. That's living in this sin-cursed world that's called life, okay? We don't follow men, okay? <clears throat> now, I cut my teeth under, you know, Stam, and, and I cut my, my teeth under, under Baker, and I cut my teeth, and those guys are all really cool leaders. Were they perfect? No. My, my grandfather, and I'm going to say this because <sighs> all these people are now in heaven. My grandfather told me that he, know, he knew Pastor Stam when he was still chasing girls around. <laughs> and now I think, Pastor Stam? <laughs> that Pastor Stam? Yeah, he knew when he was like in his 20s, okay, um, before he was married. I'm like, Pastor Stam? <laughs> you know? But hey, he was human, okay? And he's not wasn't this you know, stoic guy we think of all the time. He had his human side, too. I used to always get a kick out of uh, Paul Sadler. If you would get Paul Sadler out of his um, brethren talk, the guy was cool. He loved the Green Bay Packers, and he was a grandfather, and he was like real. But when he stood behind the pulpit, you weren't sure who he was. That was his personality. But, you know, he, he wasn't perfect either, okay? Yeah. But he didn't like the Packers, okay? And Paul goes on and he says, is Christ divided? And the answer is, well, no. Was Paul crucified for you? Uh, no. <laughs> and then he says, or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? And the answer is, no. Now, Paul's going to make a comment here next. He's going to say, in verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you 
but Crispus and Gaius, okay? Lest any should say that I have baptized in mine own name. Now, we got to remember something here. Paul is talking about those within the Corinthian church. And he's saying, I baptized two of you guys in the Corinthian church. Now, my answer is like, why did you baptize any of them? If you're teaching grace, what's the number one thing you teach people? There's no, yeah, one baptism. Now, I want you to, and this is where, this is something I struggled with for a long time. And it finally, it, it clicked and I understood it because there's two churches going on in here. When Paul would run into a kingdom saint and they accepted Christ as the Messiah, what would he do for them? I mean, I don't care if they were in the synagogue or not, they weren't saved. Once they realized Christ was Messiah and you're under the kingdom program, all right, first of all, when were all good Jewish boys circumcised? Now, do you think that mattered whether they believed or not? No. So we know everybody in the synagogue was probably circumcised, right? Whether they were saved or not. Because that's what they, do. under the law, you did it on the eighth day. Now, we know Timothy wasn't. Now, why wasn't Timothy? Remember, he was Jewish. His father was a Greek, and he's like, you ain't touching my son. <laughs> you know, which I can see that happening, okay? Paul comes along and goes, Timothy, uh, you're a Jew. Uh, you're not circumcised. First thing he does is he grabs him and circumcises him. Now, and again, some people say, I I'm blowing a lot of hot air. If, if Timothy would have been saved into the grace program, do you think it would have mattered whether he was circumcised or not? His mom. His mom. She was Jewish. And if you're Jewish, and if your mom is Jewish, you're Jewish whether you want to be or not. The, the, the line follows through the Jewish line. So Timothy was a Jew. I believe Timothy w was saved into the kingdom program, but hey, under the kingdom program, if you don't do the works, what does it prove? Your lack of faith. I think Timothy was, was, was circumcised because he was a kingdom saint, because uh, that's all his mother and grandmother knew. People are like, well, no, Paul taught him grace. Do you think Paul would have ever circumcised a grace believer? Ever? Well, he did it because of the Jews. They would have just talked. So Paul was willing to compromise for peer pressure. Really? I, I don't see it. I don't see it. I, I, I see Paul putting Timothy into the kingdom program because he was a kingdom saint. And Timothy also was given a, a spiritual gift. He laid hands on him. I think it was a gift of confidence more than anything else. But Paul names these two people in the church, and one of them is that, that guy that was in the synagogue as a former leader, okay? Lest any should say that I baptize in my own name. So he's happy he only did two of them, but my point is, why did he even do two? Because this is, this, this is way in the middle of Acts. This isn't like oh, Acts 9, 10, or 11, whatever. And what I was taught, and, and this is something that I, I, I just didn't quite believe it, but I'm like, okay, that Paul learned grace progressively. And, and that's true. Okay? Now, who taught Paul grace? You guys remember, where did he go? What school did he go to? Yeah, Jesus taught him. Okay, that, that, that's probably a good place to start, right? Um, after Paul was saved on the road to Damascus, he disappeared and went into Arabia for three years, and God taught him grace. Now, when I teach people grace, and you teach people grace, how soon do you get the part about water baptism is not necessary? What, what lesson is that? Is that the last lesson? Or pretty much the first lesson? So why is it that Paul, because the common answer I've been told, and again, I, I'm not, and it, well, Paul just didn't understand baptism until later on in his ministry when God finally told him, stop baptizing. Really? Or is it possible that Paul totally understood grace when he started in Acts 13, but when he ran into kingdom saints, he put him back under the law, and that's why he baptized these guys. I think that's, that's true. I, Paul did by the time Paul starts this church in Acts 13, he has got all of his ducks in order. Uh, the progressive revelation was all done being progressed, okay? I don't think God was still teaching him. Oh, Paul, you messed up on lesson five. Let's go back and study it again. <laughs> he was gone for three years. I, I think that by the time Paul came out of Arabia and, and, and ends up going to Antioch in Acts 12, that he totally understands grace. There is no, the, the progression is done, okay? There is no more learning curve. He has all of his ducks in order. Remember, Paul came out of the law. Paul had a lot of law in him, in a sense, where he understood the background. So for Paul to build grace on top of his law was really easy. But yet, when Paul goes to Corinth and he runs into these kingdom saints, 
he follows the law. Now, granted, he, he, he's happy he only did two of them, okay? I realize that, okay? Now, remember, Crispus was the chief ruler of the synagogue. And when Paul says, that, that, that's one of the guys he baptized was Crispus. So I would say he was following good kingdom doctrine because this guy, again, they were circumcised when? Eighth day. Did that make them saved? No. Right. 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 And that's why, if you look and so see, that means that they were, that was being circumcised made them right. God, God's Remember when Paul went back to Jerusalem, and he runs into James, and he says, "Oh, the people have a lot of questions." And what was the question? He's teaching people they don't have to observe the law and they don't have to be circumcised. Now, if you were a Jew and you weren't circumcised, you were cut off. And that's why the Jews are so like, no, no, you got to circumcise yet, Paul. You're so wrong. And Titus, remember, Titus went with him and Titus wasn't compelled, Galatians 1. Well, Titus was what? He was definitely homegrown Gentile, okay? He was homegrown Gentile. And, and, and Titus is like, you ain't touching me. I don't need that under grace. Now, grace, yes, we're spiritually circumcised and we're spiritually baptized. But when Paul's in the synagogue, these guys are already, they're already circumcised, okay? Other than, you know, we had a few Timothys out there probably. But and any, any Jew Paul would have ran into, I think he would have circumcised them too. Because circumcision never saved anyone, just like water baptism never did. But it did what? It proved your faith. Like, what do you mean? Well, if you didn't do it, it meant you didn't believe. Made a person, uh, put a person in a position of receiving the blessings of Abraham. Well, right. It, it, it kind of like, it proves you have faith. And, and it's all it does. If God said that all grace believers must stand on their head for 10 minutes a day, and you're like, no. <laughs> No, that's the only requirement under grace. Stand on your head. And you're like, no, I get dizzy. It's too bad, you're not saved then. You're like, like how stupid. Well, what does circumcision sound about like the same thing, doesn't it? It's like, it really is. I mean, does God have a sense of humor? That, that's a side point. I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that. If you weren't circumcised, you weren't saved. But in the same sense, now Christ comes along, John the Baptist comes along, and they add water baptism to that. So, yes, they were circumcised. These guys were, they were in the synagogue. They didn't believe Christ was the Messiah. Now, you know, Crispus believes Christ is the Messiah. What's the first thing Paul does? He baptizes them with water because he's part of the kingdom program. And then the Corinthian church was the biggest church that had a problem with that, but because it was full of kingdom saints. I think when Paul started that church in Corinth, he probably had 99% kingdom saints in it. Because they came over from next door. Now, I don't know how many people followed them, but it seems like a lot of them did, and that's what was going on. Now, Gaius, this other guy that was with him, um, uh, we're back here, um, Crispus and Gaius, we're not sure. There's about three different Gaiuses in the Bible. Um, several men in New Testament share the name Gaius, a common name in the first century. All of these men were involved in the ministry of the Apostle Paul in one way or another. So we're not exactly sure which one he's talking about. Um, but we do know for sure that Crispus was the guy who came out of the, out of the synagogue, okay? Now, <clears throat> I put this on here because I want to show you something. <laughs> in Acts chapter 19, now again, this is getting pretty far back in the Acts, all right? Paul comes, okay, it says, came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, okay, so Paul's moved on now. Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, finding certain disciples. Now again, this is a problem. Now, remember back after the Second World War ended, um, that some of these islands in the uh, Pacific, they'd, they'd go out there and they had guys that were on the island didn't know the war ended. Remember that? Yeah, I don't, you guys know. Maybe it, it, they didn't know it. No one told them. And they thought that they were still at war, and they had to convince them, no, uh, the war ended and you lost. Um, but basically, and he said unto them, now he finds his disciples. You're like, okay, what does that mean? And he asked them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And that's a good question. And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Which is like, what are you talking about, Mr. Paul? And you're like, okay, these guys are obviously behind on something. They're out of the loop as far as what's going on, yet they're disciples. 
And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? So basically they, they, were, they were water baptized, but they didn't know anything about the Holy Ghost. And they said, Unto John's baptism. All right, so when John ran around, remember John was the forerunner to Christ, he would water baptize people, and what did he say to them? Repent. Repent of what? Repent means change your mind. Repent on, you know, people say, well, that means quit sinning. Well, it doesn't really mean that. But the issue was repent on what they were doing towards God, which was nothing, and start doing what they're supposed to do, which is being Jews, or get your act together. So John was a forerunner to Christ, and John, John pointed Jesus. He said, the Messiah is coming, whose shoes I'm not worthy to tie. And so he was pointing people towards Jesus. And they said, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him. That is Jesus Christ. So John was saying, believe on Jesus. Now again, if you're being really picky on what salvation is and what the gospel is, if I came up to you and said, you need to believe on Jesus, are you saved into the body of Christ? No. no. That's a very vague fact. And I run to people to say, you need to believe in God, and then you're saved. No, that doesn't save you either. Oh, no, you need to believe in Jesus. In fact, you need to trust in Jesus. Trust what? See, you see, we got to be, when we talk to people about salvation, we have to be really exact in our words. Specific, Pacific, that's a better word. <laughs> because otherwise we're giving them, can you be half saved under grace? No. No. And there are people out there that believe in God. They believe in Jesus. They believe God created the universe. They believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And they're still going to the lake of fire. It's like, whoa. They got all the tools. What's the one thing they're missing? And Jesus died on the cross for their sins and was buried and rose again. You need to make it personal. These guys only had to believe that Jesus Christ was Jesus Christ, <laughs> that he was the Son of God. That's it. And they were saved. And then do all the works that required their faith, which is circumcision, water baptism, food laws, you know, all the cool things they had to do. So these, were these guys saved? I would say they were, they were close, but they weren't quite there yet. But if, if Jesus, they didn't know who Jesus was even. They didn't really understand. All they knew was John's baptism, that Christ was coming. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So, so Paul kind of moved them to the next step. But now if they were saved into the grace movement, would that verse even exist in your Bible? No. I don't think so. And it's this, this passage really bothered me for the longest time because it's Acts 19. And I didn't want anybody saved into the kingdom program after Acts 13. I just didn't want that because I said, this, that's a mess. But I had to have an answer for this, and that's why it, it's so easy to say, yeah, there's just two programs. Now, granted, the kingdom program is declining. I understand that. And these guys were pre-exposed to John the Baptist but they're water baptized because it was required for kingdom saints to be water baptized. So when, when Paul is out there water baptizing people, it's not because God didn't clear it up in his head yet that he hadn't progressed to the point to where he understood. The point is, Paul was only water baptizing kingdom saints. When I was, um, the first church I was in was in Altoona, Pennsylvania. And the pastor's name there was Henry Culp. And Henry Culp came out of the Dutch Reformed Church and he brought his whole church under grace. And pretty much everybody came. But then as Henry started to understand grace better, he decided one day that water baptism was not for today. Do you know what? Half his church left. Like, wow. That was the one thing they couldn't handle. And then you talk to people, that's the one thing they love. You know, People want to do that work to prove their salvation. Folks, we don't need any works today under grace, but the, the flesh loves to do something for God. And in fact, I, I think I told this in college, I wrote a paper and said, can we just do water baptism to make people happy? Just, just to make them happy. Because we know it doesn't do anything, but let's just make them happy. You know what the answer to that is? It was a sarcastic paper. Where do you stop? How about tithing? Can we add that one too? Amen? <laughs> Come on, people. Amen? <laughs> Well, that's getting a little personal, Pastor. You, know, you, you see what I'm saying? Where do you stop? And some of these food laws are kind of good, you know? Some of these rules are kind of good. Maybe we should put everybody back under the law. What do you think? See what I'm saying? It's a slippery slope. You don't go down. 
Now, but people somehow in this church, when, when Henry Culp stood up and said, water baptism is not for today, that was a point where people said, I, I can't do this anymore. And these, these people left. They were under law light, and then they just, they just wanted to have that work. So, <clears throat> Paul baptizes these guys. And uh, when, when Paul had laid their hands on them, the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And there were about 12 of them. Now, again, do grace believers speak in tongues when they're baptized? Who, no. No. Do we heal people? No. Who does that? Kingdom saints. The kingdom saints had these signs and wonders and gifts. And, and you put these kingdom saints in the, in the Corinthian church that have all these signs and wonders and gifts, and that's not what's going on here. And you put grace believers in the church, and they don't have signs and wonders and gifts. And then the flesh gets involved. What do you think you have? A mess. A mess. Because pride, again, I, I hate to say this, but the number one thing I see in grace believers, and I can include myself, is pride. We, we have pretty much all our ducks in order except that pride one keeps wandering off. <laughs> because we're, we are pretty smart. We really are. And when you talk to, to even save people today, the people's Bible knowledge today is becoming less and less and less. You know that? Um, there, there are kids out there now that have never been in church. I talked to them on my bus. They have never been in a church. Because their parents don't want to uh, in any way affect who, what they want to believe. Well, they're headed to hell. I hate to tell you this. And it's a mess. <clears throat> Acts 16. And on 13. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women, which is ordered there. And a certain woman named Lydia, seller of purple of the city of Tyatera, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of by Paul. So Paul runs into this lady named Lydia, and, and she was a, well, she, she had a little bit of knowledge, I guess you should say. And then verse 15 says, and when she was baptized, again, this is Acts 16, and it says when she was baptized. Now, as a grace believer, when are we baptized? It's a moment of salvation, right? But it's spiritual baptism. Baptism means set apart, okay? We're, we're set apart. We're now in Christ. We're also spiritually circumcised. We're set apart in a sense then too. When does that happen? At the moment of salvation. So when Paul is talking to this lady, and it says, and she was baptized, is he talking to a grace believer? I think he's talking to a kingdom saint. She had pre-exposure to the kingdom message, and um, she, she understands things, and so he water baptizes. So when Paul is out water baptizing the Acts, it's not because he's messing up every time, which is what I was taught. Paul just didn't want to give that up, and God finally had to go, no, Paul, stop it. No, Paul was doing it for a reason, because he was only doing it to kingdom saints. And I know that gets confusing, but, but Acts is not a book you go to to prove doctrine. Do you know that? Acts was not written to give us grace doctrine. That's not the purpose of the book. The purpose of the book is to show us why Israel is set aside. Anyone know why Israel is set aside? <laughs> Unbelief. No, no, no. Schofield is always right. I don't know who told you that. But no. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Way off. The, the old school field tended to lean a little bit to, more towards nine, but the new school field is definitely Acts 2. They, they wrote all that out, yeah. Schofield wanted to start the church in Acts chapter 2, and so he, he was law light, <laughs> basically. And, and again, and there's a lot of grace pastors that still don't know what to do with this baptism thing of Paul. And their answer is, well, Paul didn't have, he was still learning grace, and he didn't understand. But no, this person, you know, this lady, okay, was saved into the, into the kingdom program, and God never told the kingdom saints to stop doing kingdomy things. Remember that. When Paul goes back to, to Jerusalem later on in Acts, he runs into James, which is the half brother of Christ, and he says, Notice how zealous these people are. These thousands are zealous for the law. And Paul's answer was not, Stop it! Quit doing that! You know the law is gone. Paul never said that. What did he do? He's like, Yeah, and I'll put myself under the law voluntarily to show you that I'm on your side. Because Paul had to show the Jews that the kingdom program was still on in the sense that the law was still there and they were obeying it. So Acts makes sense then, and so does the book of Corinthians, okay? Um, okay, and it came to pass as we were in prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of deviation met us, which brought her master much gain by saying, 
the same followed Paul and us in Christ, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Now, these are Satan's minions saying this, okay? And this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said unto the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains were gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. Those Jews are just troublemakers, right? And teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in stocks. Now, at this point, the rulers think that Paul is a Jew. Okay, now you got to remember that. Now, Paul was a Jew, right? Yeah. But Paul also had dual citizenship. He also was a what? Roman. Roman. Well, Gentile too, but he also was a Roman. He more or less, to me, that's a hybrid, and he's perfect. Well, it makes it perfect what he was doing. That's right. Now, as a Roman, if you don't like something the Jews are doing, do you have to give them their day in court? No. No. Why? Because, well, yeah, Jew, Jews are, are animals. We all know they're disgusting people. If we want to kill them, we kill them. Big deal. Romans had no respect for Jews because they weren't Romans. Now, and so these guys are thinking, here's this Jew causing trouble. Let's throw him in prison. Let's beat him up a little bit. Maybe he'll learn his lesson. If he dies, he dies. Who cares? Okay? Is there going to be an investigation of Paul if a, if a Jew dies in prison? Nope. Nope. Stuff happens, okay? That's like, if you understand Islam, and they call, what do the Islams call us? They call us infidels. You know what that means? Non-Islamic, basically. Um, the reason they have no trouble killing infidels is because we are not real people. You're like, where do you get that from? Sorry, if you're not Islamic, you don't, you don't have a right to live. I'm like, how would you think that? Well, the Romans thought the same thing towards Jews. Hey, even if Christ was innocent, He's a Jew. Who cares? Just kill him. Maybe it'll make peace. They, they really, in their mind, they like, how can people think that's stupid? They can. Okay? So, Paul's now in prison, okay? And they're going to, you know, basically do something to him. And it says, At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, waking up of his sleep, seeing the prison doors open, drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing the prisoners had fled. Now this I like. Under Roman law, if you were charged in, in keeping someone in prison and they escaped, what did they do to you? They killed you. <laughs> now, if you get back and understand what happened at Christ's his, his resurrection, there were a whole bunch of Roman guards that were guarding the tomb to make sure that the disciples didn't steal Jesus. Now, they didn't think he was going to get resurrected from the dead. They thought someone was going to steal him and then say he was resurrected. And when Christ rose from the dead, it scared these guards so much, what did they do? They ran off. Remember that? Now, under Roman law, what was supposed to happen to all these guards? Killed but the, the pol politics of the day stepped in and they paid enough people off and it didn't happen. Um, but that's what's going on here. Even though Paul was just a Jew, according to them, this guy, you know, he escaped, and so this guy is thinking, oh no, I'm dead, okay? And that's why he's going to kill himself. Wow, okay? But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm, we're all here. Paul's aware of what's going on. Now, interesting, um, I don't think they had emergency lighting in the prison at that time. <laughs> it was probably dark out. I think God told him, Paul, you know, I could be wrong. I think that. And this is why we're here. And then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, th this is interesting. Paul was in prison, and the whole time he was in prison, he was screaming, I want my lawyer. You think that's what he was screaming? No. What was he doing? He was singing praises unto God. He was witnessing to these Romans. Okay. He was, and so now these guys are like, oh no, what you're saying must be true. And so this guy wants to know how you can be saved. And they believed, and he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now, if that's all Paul said, was this guy saved into the grace program or the kingdom program? <laughs> okay, let's go on, okay? And thy house, which means anyone. 
And they spake unto him the words of the Lord and all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour at night, washed their stripes, and was baptized. This is Acts 16. Now, this one I don't have a good answer for, except I do know that was water. If this guy was saved in the kingdom program, he had to be water baptized. Okay? Hmm. I would think Paul would have taught him grace, being that he was a Roman. I don't know why he didn't. It could have been because of the people around him, but, but he, he and his straight way. Okay? So I, I, there are things going on that I don't understand sometimes, but I do know when Paul water baptized, he only water baptized that people who were put into the kingdom program. And it sounds to me like the Philippian jailer, who probably was not Jewish, okay? He was Roman, was put in the kingdom program, because I don't believe Paul would have ever water baptized him otherwise. No way. He would not have confused it. He would have been a proselyte. Yeah, he would have been a proselyte. And because both programs are going on, side by side, and I think because there were only kingdom saints in that area, or whatever the case was, this guy became a proselyte. He became part of the kingdom program. That, that bothers me, and I don't have a good answer for it, but I wanted to take you there because it, there, we have to have an answer for that. Yes, James? I think in order to properly understand Philippians amongst us, Acts 30 through 32, you have to also read Acts, that same chapter, 16, verses 9 and 10. Okay, okay, that could be. So, all right, so let's go back to 1 Corinthians. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 16, And I baptize also the house of Stephanaeus, besides I know not whether I baptize any other. So the issue was, you know, they were saying, oh, Paul baptized me. Um, they were following Ben. But then Paul says something that's, that's really interesting. For Christ sent me not to baptize. Well, then why is Paul out there baptizing later in the book of Acts? He's not listening. No, he's only doing it for kingdom saints. Now, again, I, I spent a lot of time today going through this because once you see that, it's like, oh, now I understand. Because otherwise, why was Paul bringing all this baggage back into the, the grace movement? He wasn't. But because both programs are going on side by side, it, it, it helped understand. Paul was not baptizing grace believers. Oh, he didn't understand. No, he understood. He was not baptizing grace believers. He was only baptizing kingdom saints, okay? For Christ sent me not to baptize, that's water, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be of none effect. Doesn't this read a little bit different than believe in Jesus stuff? The emphasis is Jesus Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection. Folks, when you talk to people about salvation, always bring in the cross of Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection. Don't try to make it so simple that you don't do that. Just believe in Jesus. Just believe in God. That doesn't save you under grace. And there's nobody being added to the kingdom program today, so that's not going to work either, okay? You have to bring in, because it has to be personal. They have to be able to say, yes, Jesus died for my sins. Have to personalize it. That's so important, okay? Anyways, that, that's a lot of words. I understand that. Um, and I don't even know how long I went. But, but that's, that's why Corinthians works because we have these two groups and we're going to see starting next week and stuff to where Paul is talking to me and saying hey some of you guys have a kingdom hope and some of you have a heavenly hope and you need to get along and, and that's the key let's pray Lord Heavenly Father we again thank you for salvation Lord we thank you that Christ died on the cross for our sins and we we pray Lord that we can